Welcome to our vocal master class. I'm Dr. Gennar Lombardazzi, Assistant Professor of Voice and Director of Opera in the Hayes School of Music at Appalachian State University. Um, at the Hayes School, I am responsible for directing and producing our opera productions and teaching applied voice to undergraduate and graduate voice majors. Just a personal note before we get started so you can kind of see where I land on, on some philosophy about singing. Um, to me, singing is all about communication. I started singing as, as most of us do, just copying sounds I heard and looking up to certain artists that I admired in all sorts of um, genres. And early on I learned that good singing isn't limited to a certain style of music, um, but that an honest and free sound production in any style has the ability to reach an audience. So as we talk about some of these things today, um, we'll actually reach some of that in the performance section, but I just wanted to add that. Okay, so today um, we're going to talk about a few things. Caring for your instrument and voice, um, preparing for rehearsal and practice, and then some performance tips. Some of this um, might be um, repeated material for some of you, um, but I feel like it's good to go over a lot of this because uh, some of these um, points address a lot of the questions I get in my studio. So first we'll talk about caring for your instrument. Okay. So you've probably heard that as a vocalist, our entire bodies are our instruments. The vocal cords and the larynx are just a small part of what you need to focus your care on. So to care for your body is to care for your instrument. Now the next part, this is, this is obviously true for our people, but singers especially should be aware of the amount of water that they consume, the types of food that they put in their bodies, and the amount of exercise they are getting. I'm a firm believer that if your body remains healthy, then your voice has a better chance of achieving clean and vibrant sounds. I know that's true because I've failed on the other side of it. So you need to make sure you take care of your body. It's really, really important. Um, there's nothing worse than coming up on a performance and having an illness to contend with. It's stressful. You don't want to do that. So get ahead of it by taking care of yourself and just avoid those stressful circumstances. Okay. Some of the topics underneath caring for your instrument. General health, allergies and illness, always a pain, and avoiding fatigue, which I know is an issue for a lot of the students that I have in my studio. So first, general health. Okay, this is, just seems silly to say all of this, but um, I know a lot of people um, don't even take into account what they put in their bodies and um, the amount of exercise they get as it relates to their singing. Um, but if you want to be a singer, and if that's something you want to do for the rest of your life, your body needs to be tuned into the right, um, it just needs to be clicking. Everything needs to be moving well. So that starts with eating well. And I have down here balanced nutrition, which can mean a million things to a million different people. So um, you, you just want to make sure that the fuel you're putting into your body is serving it well. Um, drink plenty of water. Also something you've heard, I'm sure, a million times. <laughs> Um, it's hard to do this sometimes unless you have a little bit of a vessel that you keep with you. So um, I just keep a little water bottle with me, sometimes even a gallon jug if I can't find my water bottle. And just keep it with you all day and then you can sip on it and then fill up um, later on and just keep it in your system. And just get into a habit of it. If it's a habit, you'll do it all the time and you don't have to worry about it. The exercise thing is also hard because I think everybody has... Um, different needs for their exercise and also uh, abilities and what their body can handle. So just make sure you're moving your body. Um, you know, if the blood's moving through your system and you're getting all the nutrients kind of pumped throughout your system, um, it's good for you, right? Move your body. And also, as a singer, you're going to be on stage moving and um, you need to be able to move your body. So um, just keep that in mind. Exercise is important, um, not only as a, just a human, but um, as a singer. Exercise. Use that body. Okay, allergies and illness. Um, unfortunately, allergies and illness can really be an issue for vocalists. I have students coming into my studio every week with complaints about illness and allergies, and the only way to avoid these is to get ahead of them. Once you're sick, you're sick, um, and if you have a performance two days later, it's really hard to get rid of. You don't want to be taking steroids or anything like that to get the, the swelling to go down your throat. The best way to do it is just avoid it, and that's, I know I can just say that, but it's um, get into another habit of um, washing your hands and doing things like that so you can get ahead of it. 
With allergies, if you know you have allergies that come up in certain seasons, see a doctor that can help you find some relief. Allergies cause swollen cords, and swollen vocal cords can make singing really difficult and extremely frustrating. Um, sometimes you'll be working on a technical thing, you're like, well, I could do this, you know, last week, and today I just can't do it, so you try harder and try harder and try harder, it just won't happen because your cords are swollen. So if you can take care of those issues and just get them out of the way, um, you'll avoid frustration and um, stress, and it'll just, you know, make your singing life a whole lot easier. Um, use the medication necessary to do so if your doctor has given it to you. And like I said before, for illness, the best defense is just taking care of yourself and avoiding illness by washing your hands and getting plenty of sleep. Um, I know for my college students, a lot of them are doing projects until 3 in the morning and then getting up at 7 to go to class. So a lot of times they don't get sleep, and that's when illness likes to creep in. Um, and then, you know, you're out of commission for two weeks of practice because um, you're unable to get your vocal cords together because they're so swollen, you can't sing. So um, as a singer, you need to be very mindful of that and just stay ahead of it. Um, take care of yourself so that you are not getting sick. Okay, avoiding fatigue. Young singers have the habit of overusing their voices, which causes fatigue and leads to damage of the cords. Be mindful of this, and when your voice begins to feel fatigue, don't be afraid to give it a rest. It's really hard as a, um, well, it's really hard as an, an old person too, but as a youngster, you have all these things that you're doing, maybe in a band, you may be in a, a musical theater show that has a lot of rehearsal, um, you might have a, some really talkative friends, um, you might be in an opera, you might have a recital that you're doing and you're just singing and using that voice all the time. Um, you just have to keep it in check. If, you're, if you have a performance coming up, be careful of it. If your voice hurts in rehearsal, just let your director know and, and see if you can take a break or just mouth the words or watch the music. Be in communication with the people around you and let them know when your voice feels fatigued. Um, there's other things that you can work on when your vocal cords aren't agreeing with you, but you need to give them rest, um, and that's the only way that they'll, they'll come back. Um, what's this last point? If you have an important performance coming up, try not to use your voice, speaking or otherwise, for most of the day leading up to it. Yeah, so I tell my students when they have a recital coming up just to chill out on the day that they're um, they're the day before, the night before, the day of their recital or performance. Um, not talking to a lot of friends, um, not doing anything other than warming up the voice for singing, and that way they're fresh for their performance, and it, it just feels better to have a fresh um, fresh voice as you go to sing. Okay, the next thing we have is preparation for rehearsal and practice. Um, so. I feel like a lot of um, students don't plan their practice time well, and they don't know exactly what it means to warm up. They've sort of um, done it in choir, but then they get on their own and they just sort of do some exercises and don't really have an idea why or what even to do, just sort of throw the voice out there and sing a little bit. So we're gonna give you a little bit of structure for both of those, planning your practice time and also your warm ups. Okay. Plan your goals for each practice and rehearsal session. Oftentimes we don't go into a practice room and know um, a plan as we, and what we would like to accomplish. So make your rehearsal efficient by structuring your time. For example, if you have an hour to practice, divide it into sections. So um, there, are, there are aspects that in, in practice, but the main ones are you need to warm up. Usually you're working on something technical in your voice and then also you're learning um, music. Oftentimes I have, I ask my students, okay, how did you practice this week? And I'm like, well, you know, I kind of warmed up and then I, you know, learned, went through six or seven songs and learned them. And to me that, you know, at least they're getting into the practice room, but it's not efficient. Um, they need to plan the time that they're, that they're in the room and maybe get, you know, one or two songs learned, but also they need to work on their breath support, their throat space, all these things that we've worked on in lessons. So, I tell them in, a, in an hour less or an hour uh, practice session, the first little bit you have to warm up. You're lining up your instrument, so maybe 10 minutes. Um, find find what the voice feels like and go throughout the range. Warm up the body, and then the next bit, um, maybe practice some of the technical issues that I've 
I've helped them with, give them some exercises they can go through that um, whatever they're working on, whether it be resonance or range or breath support, whatever it is, maybe do that for 20 minutes. And then in the last bit, 30 minutes, you know, pluck out the notes to your music, be listening to your music, um, learning your languages, things like that. And while you're doing that, you're applying um, the technical issues that you've worked on the 20 minutes previously. So that to me is a pretty good template for an hour um, practice session. It can go, you know, it can have some variances there, but that's a pretty good structure. Warming up. So warming up is important for a sex successful practice or rehearsal. You're preparing your body and voice for singing mode, which is different from your everyday normal use of the body. Everyone has a different approach for warming up. So with your teacher, come up with a routine that works for you. But no matter what exercises you use, the most important thing to keep in mind is the goal you are trying to achieve in a warm up, which is preparing the voice for singing. If you go through vocal exercises without intention, the warm up session really doesn't help. So if you just heard an exercise and you're doing it for just because it, it's not efficient for the um, for the rehearsal time or the practice time, the warm up. Make sure you know what that exercise is doing, what you're supposed to be feeling in each exercise. I'm going to give you an, an example of how you might use this. Um, so the goals I see it as warming up are these four points below. There are a tremendous amount of vocal exercises that can get the job done in a warm up if you're keeping these four things in mind in almost every exercise. So posture is really important. Use of the breath and support. Throat space and tone. And those four things might mean different things to different people, but I'm going to go ahead and give you some, some pointers as we go through here. Okay, so for posture. Posture is super important for singing because it aligns your body and it, it can help for your sound. A super easy adjustment from here to here can, can free up the throat. So most of us don't spend all of our time in the day practicing good posture. We sit at desks, hunched over our phone, and engaged in other activities that don't put our body in proper alignment. When you get into the practice room, keep this in mind and establish good singing posture before you do your warm-ups so that everything has that alignment ready to go. Um, sometimes students will, or me too, sit at the piano and I'll be doing my work hunched over looking down at a score and it just doesn't help. Um, stand up, your sternum should be a little bit elevated and you should be looking straight forward. So as you, if, you're, if you're working on music and you're always tilted down like this, the larynx is getting pushed on and it's, it's not free to do what it needs to do. So do your best to find a stand or something where you can get the music up. And this is, this is the position that you should be in as you sing. This is too far. This is good. This is too far down. That's for your neck. And then as far as, as, as being open here with the sternum up, just feel your sternum being lifted up just a little bit. And that'll open up everything here. The, the shoulders will kind of stay relaxed and down. And it'll open up your... Um, your breath mechanism. Cool. Okay. Another goal for warming up is use of breath and support. One of the main goals, um, sorry, I just said that, didn't I? Okay. Something we don't generally use throughout the day and it is um, the most important component to healthy tone production. The most important, I feel. Exercises you use in warm up should address the breath and how it is used for singing. Um, as I'm speaking now, I'm not speaking with good support, and I don't do that throughout the day unless I'm in front of a whole lot of people where I, I have to get into my actual core of sound. <laughs> it just sounds ridiculous, but um, you need that as you sing, right? That support. So um, as you're going through the day, it doesn't, it doesn't help you out. You've trained your muscles and your body not to be supporting. So that's one of the biggest um, warm-up goals is finding, finding the depth of breath, right? So I have this example of lip trill slides, um, which is just from the bottom up to the top and down, and no real um, goal of how high or how low. You just from a low point in your voice to a high point in your voice and back down. So to find support, uh, just a really easy concept is as you're going up, you think about sending the breath down. That's just it's sort of a simple concept that helps find breath support. The difference in the lip trill sound would be 
breath going up. Breath going down. And you can hear it already, it's, it's engaging everything. It sounds a lot more supported. So as you're doing the lip trills or any exercise, be thinking down with the breath as you go up to find that support. Throat space is also a really good thing to think about as you're warming up. Um, you set your space to where it should, should be to achieve a free sound throughout the voice. And the beginning of a yawn is a good reference of how it should feel. So it kind of, it sounds like this, sounds ridiculous, but the soft palate's up a little bit. You have a little bit of spread in the pharynx or the back part of the belt. And then the larynx is just sort of relaxed. So everybody has a different sensation. It takes practice to find the, the perfect space. But your warm-up really should address that because it's also something we don't use throughout the day. So again, warm-up. You're trying to find that, that everything lined up for the singing situation, and the throat space is one of them. You can also address this in a lip trill. Um, you keep that same trill going, but you have that yawn space back there as you do the trill. If you don't have that yawn space back there as you're doing the trill, you're actually training your larynx and all that space to be gone. So as you go to sing, the warm-up hasn't helped you a whole lot other than move the breath. So as you do the lip trill, think about that yawn space. So if I take that yawn space out and I just sing like my speaking voice space, the lip trill sounds like this. And then as I sing, it'd be ah, not the prettiest sound. And then if you put the space back in and do the lip trill, it's a little fuller sound, a little freer, and you have a lot more option. Okay. Um, Another thing we can talk about is the tone. Um, I think when people think about warming up, they think about literally getting the voice warm or something, you know, you know, using your voice, which is important. Your chords aren't used to being um, in the right position for singing as you go throughout your day. So it is important to go through the whole range and sort of remind yourself what it feels like to, to be in singing mode. Um, but that was just one tiny portion of warm-up, as, as we talked about earlier with, you know, support, throat space, posture. They're all important to um, warming up. So um, tone is something important that to address, though, and allowing the, the vocal folds to kind of come together in a way that works best for singing. Um, and lip trills can do this, too, if you're keeping this in mind. So if you do this lip trill slide, you can feel the difference between a breathy sound, and a good chord um, closure, or with your vocal cords together a little bit, getting that um, cleaner tone. So breathy. So it should never feel like that in your lip trill, or you are not helping um, your warm-up situation. Find that sort of um, closed tone. So the difference in, um, if I take the lip trill out, ah, right? Ah, those will be the difference um, different sounds that you're training your voice to do. Second one's a little bit um, better for what you're looking at. Okay, we're into performance tips. Performance can be exciting, stressful, and sometimes glorious. It is so easy to get caught up in trying to make performance perfect that we forget the communication part of it, which I think is just, it's, it's what you should be thinking about all the time. Our job as a performer is to communicate our expression in every song we sing. Um, that's why the audience came to see us. I can't tell you how many times I did a performance and I thought, wow, I just nailed that high note, I crushed it, it was so good. No one ever compliments me on my high notes. They come up and they say, um, that, was, uh, that, was a, that was such a great performance because of the way that you, you know, approached this text, or the way that you made me feel, or anything other than what I thought was the best part of my performance, you know, with the technical points where I thought my voice was just clicking, it sounded great, I had all these great you know, dynamic levels and whatever. But really what the audience is there to do, they're just there to take your expression. They want to feel something. And that's why we got into um, music to begin with, I think, is because we felt something. So um, I, think, I think sometimes this, these expressions that we have, they come in as vocal acrobatics because that's what the composer wrote. But even if that is the case, um, Every single time that we use our voice, the performance needs to be some sort of communication with the audience. As a performer, I feel that keeping this mindset helps to alleviate stress and also sets us up for greater delivery. If you keep it in mind, if you keep that performance idea in mind where you're communicating, you're going to be thinking about the text and this phrase and how can I, how can I pull at the heartstrings of these folks or how can I make them stand up and just you know, cheer for this character? Um, and if you're thinking about that, 
your voice is going to take care of a lot of the technical aspects on its own. And you're not going to be as stressed out, as um, sort of guided by your nerves in the wrong way. Um, so these are just a, a few more bullet points on that. Another, to be successful in a performance, you need a warm up um, like you would for um, your practicing. So you're going to be on a stage or wherever you're doing your performance. You're not going to be speaking, you're going to be singing. So warm up your voice with the intent to make that singing sound. Get your body ready to sing. Um, in your preparation, find the good stuff in the text you are singing and show the audience how you feel about it. You need to find connections to the songs that you sing. And sometimes we as teachers, we just, we give songs out because we know they're going to help the vocal technique. But it's your job as a performer to look into that song and find out something that really moves you or, or you know, makes, me, makes you feel something. Grab onto that and go for it hard so that um, that honest connection you have with the text, it, it goes across into the audience and it's a brilliant performance. It could be the most simple song in the world. But if you have that engagement and that idea of communication, it's, it's going to really move an audience. Um, this next one's about nerves. You should let your nerves excite you, I wrote, and, and ride that wave. Um, live performances are supposed to have flaws. And just know that going in, you're going to be nervous. But I think nerves can help you if you, if you keep, keep the idea in your mind that this, you know, this live performance is just going to happen and you embrace the flaws. And as something happens that maybe you vocally you didn't expect, um, go with it, turn it into the character, and make the performance something that no one else has ever heard. Because it is live, it's only gonna happen this way one time. That's what makes it so special. So let those nerves excite you at the possibility of, you know, who knows what's gonna happen. It's, it is exciting. And you might fall on your butt, um, and that's okay. I've done it many times. Everybody has. The best singers in the world have fallen. And get up for the next one. Um, the next one I have is go out on the stage with the intent, intent to communicate, not to wow. The wow is in the communication. So we talked about that quite a bit. Just always have that in your mind. Communicate, communicate. Say what you want to say in that song and then let the voice carry it. Let that high note be part of that communication. Let the flourish, the fast notes be part of that communication. Lastly, get excited about the next performance and fall in love with the challenges that good singing brings. Singing is awesome because it is movable, because it, it touches souls, and because it's, it's a creation that the human body makes. Um, we're the instrument that gets to do that. We have text. Um, we're really lucky in that, and we need to embrace that and share that. Um, and your voice will grow, and you get a good voice teacher, and your vocal technique will just you know, um, get better and better and better with your practice. Um, but behind that needs to be this love for performance and what it really means to be a good communicator. Okay, that does it for the, the vocal master class here. I hope you enjoyed some of that information and um, best of luck in all of your work as a vocalist and please come, come see us at Appalachian State University. Thank you. <laughs>